Hello fellow JavaScript developers. My name is Rafael and today I'm going to show you how to create a notes app using vanilla JavaScript. If you have been watching my videos for some time or at all, you know that I like to mess around with vanilla JavaScript despite there being a plethora of frameworks out there, mostly just for myself to learn and also share a little bit of that journey with you all. And I found this awesome repo called App Ideas by this user called Pop 17 I'll just navigate it to here now, and I'll also leave a link to this repo in the description. But what this repo does is it provides different tiered projects that you can use to apply any new knowledge you learned. Whether you are learning a new language or learning a new technology, messing around with a new framework, oftentimes the hardest part is actually applying that knowledge and getting it to stick. So like I said, this breaks things down in easy tiers that you can look at. So you have beginner projects, intermediate projects and advanced projects. And my goal with these videos is pretty much to go through every single one, showing you all how I go through it. I try not to script these videos too much. I, I like to have a little bit of organization just to make it easier for you to view. But for the most part, you know, I think it's good that you see me go through the process of doing everything, making mistakes, fixing them, thinking about other things that maybe other channels might just show you a finished product. I like to really just take you through zero to hero, as they say. <laughs> so with that being said, the application that we're going to be working on today is called the Notes app. So let's just go over it briefly and see what we're in store for. So the Notes app, it says that we can create and store our notes for a later purpose. And we have some user stories here that we'll be working through. So a user can create a note, a user can edit a note, a user can delete a note. And finally, when closing the browser window, the notes will be stored. And when the user returns, the data will be retrieved. And as far as bonus features go, the user can create and edit a note in Markdown format. And on save, it will convert Markdown to HTML. And finally, the user can see the date when he created the note. And we have some useful links and resources here, like local storage guides, Markdown guide, and then the Markdown parser will probably be able to use and some example projects that show that. So fun project. I think we can really learn a lot through here, and I'm excited to also be working on it with you all. Before I begin, I should also note that the reason I started getting back into this is because I have recently become an affiliate with a website called Great Front End. So just to let you know, anything that I do discuss here, it really is my honest opinion on how I feel about this platform. And if you do decide to end up getting one of their different tiers of membership, I do get a commission based off that. So I just want to let you know about that before I start diving a little bit into this platform. So. I do have experience with several platforms of which I won't name names now, but you know, during the time of interviewing and just trying to better myself as an engineer, I went out there, I did my research, I joined many different platforms, most of which I ended up having neutral feelings about. But Great Front End was the first one that I saw that I felt really good about because you can tell that the people that created it, if you actually look on the front page, you'll see that this website was contributed by X interviewers at Google, Amazon, and Meta. And you can really tell based on the question quality and answer quality that they, they really do want the best for the people that get enrolled in this. And just to give you an idea of some of the questions they have here, you can see things like JavaScript utilities, user interface, data structures, and algorithms. And I liked that they had a lot to mess with. So you can implement some of these with vanilla JavaScript, like I'll be doing today with the notes app. You can use React. But some of the things that I like that maybe some of the others didn't have is just a different sorts of questions. Like for example, implementing the famous holy grail layout or implementing a depth first search or a heap search heap sort or promise.all, right? We can go to user interface and we can learn about building a contact form or an accordion. This is a premium feature and you, you'll get it if you actually subscribe. So there's a lot of really good stuff to go around here. If you need some more handholding or if you need, you know, more of a structured guide, they even have one month, one week and three month preparation plans that you can follow to really help keep you on track. So if this is something you're interested in, you just want to take your front end engineering knowledge to the next level. I'd highly recommend greatfrontend.com. I've had a fantastic time being a part of their community on Discord and just getting to chat with everyone else who's a part of it. So again, if you're interested, make sure to come and get your new year sale. You get another 20% off. And like I said, the, the pricing's pretty good. I do enjoy it. And I see this as an investment, right? I mean, you're investing in your future and a little bit here can take you a very long way in the future. So with that being said, Let's go ahead and get started on the Notes app. 
All right, before we start getting into any code, I think it's definitely worth it for us to do some whiteboarding. Not only is it gonna help me do my own practicing, it's also gonna hopefully help you all get a more conceptual idea of what it is that we'll be doing. So let's think about how we wanna structure this up. The way that I see it is I'm gonna draw this whole square, which essentially represents the viewport, right? And in the viewport, the way that I'd like to structure this is I can imagine that, you know, of course, maybe we'll have, let's say we have like a title here, notes, Maybe, maybe something like notes manager, I can, that can work. Let's make it a little bit bigger notes manager. And probably we'll have some type of form up here because that, that will be where we actually get user input. So let's say they'll be able to add a heading. They'll be able to write some content. And finally, they'll be able to click on some button that will allow for them to save. I'll put some placeholders here. I put something like heading and I, I probably could make this a little bit smaller heading a little bit smaller. There you go. Heading. I'll copy that and I'll come here and I'll just label this as content. Right. And then we'll just have this button right here. Be save or not save, but this will be submit because we're actually going to be submitting a form. That makes more sense. Let me make this button just a little bigger so we can fit that nicely. So imagine this is our little form up here where we can enter heading, we can put our content and then we'll submit. Probably we'll have some divider here just to show the distinction between both of these parts. And then finally down here, we'll have our different notes. And on each note, right? On each note, we'll have the heading and the content just like we let the user input it. So you can imagine on the top right here, we'll have heading. I got to sneeze one second. <coughs> wow, that was a great sneeze. You ever have a sneeze that's really good? I think most sneezes are really good, but this one, that was, that was really nice. Okay, so heading and content, and then we'll also provide a way for a user to delete a note and then I'm thinking for them to edit it. I know there's an attribute. I think it's a global attribute called content editable. And we'll make these have that attribute. That way a user can just come in here and, and write whatever they want. And that will effectively edit the note. So this is a little bit of how our UI will look. And now let's talk a little bit maybe of the interfaces or the different objects that we'll be managing here. So I kind of want to select all this and move it over. Generally speaking, I like to work top down but let's think about this, right? So we're going to have a, let's see, I'd like to maybe make a component for each one of these. So I feel like we will have, let's say we will have a form class, right? A form class. We will have a notes class. We will have a note class and we'll also have a storage class. The storage class will be what we use for local storage at the time that we need it, right? And each one of these will manage itself and it will also communicate with the other ones. So what I should have done is I should have put these on their own sort of, I should have put these on their own text boxes because I want to write more. So let me just, let me just write this here. So we have an idea of what the classes will be, right? And then under here, for example, like form class should do what? So the form class, all it needs to be able to do is just take in some user input and submit, submit that data, right? So we'll need some event listener that's going to listen for that submit action and then submit that data and make it available for the notes manager. That's, that's the way that I see it, right? So we'll need to, let's see, event listener and we'll say submit. This is just how I'll denote an event listener for submit. And then we'll also have you know, an on submit method, right? And that will just handle the submission of this form. I think that's pretty good for now. And then after this, we'll have our notes class. So the notes class should know how to add a note <clears throat> and to add a note, it will need to have a content and heading. And then it should also be able to add several notes. And the reason I'm adding several notes here is because this part of where is it when closing the browser, the notes will be stored. And when the user returns, the data will be retrieved. So when the data is retrieved, we should be able to just add multiple notes, right? 
So add notes will take a note and then it'll know how to add that note. So on that note, <laughs> I'm actually going to call this I note so we can distinguish between the note class and the no and the I note interface. I didn't mean to put a dot there. But let's go ahead here and let's make an I note. I think helpful things to have on I note would be of course the content which would be a string. We'll have a date which will be I think effectively a string though. I mean, it, it kind of is like a date object. It also should have a heading. And finally, it should have an ID, which will be a number. That's just to uniquely identify it. So this is the notes class where you can add a note, we could add notes. And then finally, for the note class, different from the notes interface, let me just come down here. So note class. The note class should know how to, let's see, delete itself, right? It should be able to delete itself. It should be able to edit itself. It should be able to generate itself. And I'll, I'll explain more of what that means in a moment because I have an idea of how I want to structure this. So we can delete it, we can edit it, we can generate it. And I think that's mainly it. Yeah, I think that gets us most of the way there. So already now we have sort of a, a nice structure that we're dealing with here. We have a form class, a notes class, and a note class. And we have this iNote interface, and we'll sort of create our app like this. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to try to break this up into several sections. That way it's very easy for any one of these classes. You can see how I'm creating it, and I'm going to try to keep each section shorter or short-ish. You know, this will take some time, but it will be a lot of fun, and we'll, we'll go through it together. So I think in the next section, we can get started with just some of the basic setup and see if we can start at least just designing a little bit of this and maybe just adding some hard coded data so we can see how everything will eventually be laid out. So let's do that in the next section. Okay, so I already created a notes directory inside of my with vanilla parent project. And inside of here, we can start running some code. So I think let's do the three files that we definitely will need. Or actually, we can just do HTML and CSS for now. I just really want to create the skeleton structure and see how things are going to start looking before we get too into the weeds of the JavaScript, because that's where the majority of this is going to you know, take place in the JavaScript. But it's good that we go through all these steps. So right off the bat, in index.html, we can use the exclamation mark in VS Code to use the Emmet abbreviation just to get an HTML5 compliant skeleton structure that really gets us off to the races immediately. We'll call this notes manager. And this is already good. I mean, we're already like, as far as HTML goes, we're pretty much there. I, I want to use bootstrap just to make this look nice. And I haven't used bootstrap in so long. So let's hope it's not very hard to get started with. Let me see. So yeah, I'm okay with using the alpha. Read the docs, quick start. Okay, so we are creating a new index HTML file in our root project. Include the meta name viewport tag as well for proper responsive behavior. Okay, include bootstraps, CSS, and JS. Place the link tag in the head for our CSS and the script tag for our JavaScript bundle before the closing body. Okay, you can also include popper. Open the page in your browser of choice to see your bootstrap page. Now you can start building with bootstrap by creating your own layout. Okay, cool. So let me, let's see how this works, right? So let's take the link and I'll load this one first. Okay. And then we can, we can actually just load ours after index CSS. Okay. And the JavaScript. I know it says to load it in the body, but I'm actually going to use, I'm actually going to put it in the head, but I'm going to attach the defer attribute. So what defer does, and it's different than your standard vanilla script tag. So a standard vanilla script tag, what happens is when the HTML is downloaded by the browser and it's beginning to be parsed, let's say it gets like 50% of the way of seeing the HTML. When it sees a script tag, it pauses HTML parsing and starts parsing and executing the JavaScript. This is why they tell you to put the script tag before the ending body tag. That way, by the time you get to the script tag, all the HTML has been parsed and you can access the DOM the right way in your JavaScript code. 
But what the defer does is it doesn't block JavaScript parsing like the vanilla script tech does, but it does wait for the HTML to be completely loaded before it's evaluated. So the defer attribute is a pretty nice thing that we can do here. And I think it makes sense for this project. So this should get us most of the way there. I have an extension called prettier. I'm sorry, not prettier. Well, I do have prettier and it's why you might see some layout shift on the code every time I save because it formats automatically for me. But I have a, an extension called live server, which allows me to click on this button in the bottom right and get a live server. And the reason I'm running this is I just want to make sure there's no errors, which is good. I don't see any errors. So it seems like we're probably good to go. So let's see what we can do. How what's the best way for me to create a, a layout because it said here important global environment. Oh, creating my own layout. Here we go. The grid system. Grid options equal with I don't really want Oh, setting one column with I don't think I, I want this. I just want one sort of column. I think they had something else earlier here. Layout Oh, containers. So if I do div class container fluid containers for a full width container spanning the entire width of the viewport, I think this can be a good place for us to start. So inside index HTML inside of here, what I'm going to do is instead of making this a div, I'll actually make this a section. And I will call this notes container fluid. Let's see what that gets us. So if I view this, we have HTML. We have our body, we have our section here, which it looks like it does span. Yeah, it looks like it does span the entirety of the page, which is good. So if we start adding some stuff in here, I know we had the notes manager. Just getting some very basic CSS here, right? Let's come over here. Let's add a class. We'll call this class heading. Side of heading, I just want to make this text align center so it's nicely centered. Okay, and then I think underneath that, we'll just go ahead and put our form. So, do they have oh, nice, they have stuff for forms here. Yeah, this is pretty much exactly what we want, right? Now, is there is there a text area? Disabled forms, accessibility, form. Oh, here we go. This is almost exactly what we need. This is exactly what we need. Now, this is not wrapped. Oh, this is weird because it's not wrapped in a form. Ah, but this one is. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this here right under my H1. I'll copy all this, but then in form control, I just want these two right here. So I think right on top of the button, I can probably do this. I should kind of pretty much get us most of the way there. Let's see. Let me just rename some of these, make it more relevant to our project here. So label for, okay, so this is email address. We want this to be heading. Here we'll call this heading. Uh, we'll make this type text, ID of heading and placeholder. We don't need a placeholder here label for we'll set this to content we'll make this content okay id content form control submit submit maybe here we can say something like create notes make it like a little more sensible if that's even the right word okay so i mean this looks this looks awesome actually this is almost exactly what i wanted i don't i don't care for it to be so so big though because it is like huge right now, but I guess that's fine. Let me see if maybe, how can I create a separate container that is just like 50% extra small, extra small. What does this mean? 100% 540 pictures, default, responsive, fluid. Can we make it max width at each responsive breakpoint? Default container. Our default container class is a responsive fixed width container, meaning its max width changes at each breakpoint. Responsive container, 100% wide onto a small breakpoint. 
layout, grid, columns, gutters, overview. I guess, let me see, container fluid, which is width, container breakpoint, which is width 100% until the specified breakpoint, container which sets a max width at each responsive breakpoint. I'm curious if we just did container, how would that look? So here I will do a container and I'll get my form and I'll just place in there. Is that gonna change anything? Is that, is that actually gonna make it smaller? Okay, so that's a little bit smaller. That's actually better. I do, I do like this. So let's see now how we can get like a line break going. Is there, is there a line break? Is there a search here? Line break. Text. But just a break. I mean, if not, we can just use the HR tag. Yeah, I think that's fine. Let's just do that to make it easier. So we have our notes container. We have this. We have our div. So right under here, I'll just put HR. And there you go. So we'll get we'll get this sort of divider here, which is nice. So this is cool because now we have user input and we also have this button right here. And what I'll also do is make these inputs required because definitely to make a note, you'll need to have written a heading and content, right? So I like I like the way this is so far. Again, we have our title, we have our form, and now we can actually start writing some JavaScript to get some of the data that's inside of here. So let's do that in the next section, starting with the form, since that's the most important thing. Okay, so the first class I think that we need to work on is going to be our form class, because that's really all we have on the screen right now. And it's the most important way for us to be able to get user input. So what I want to do is I'm going to create JavaScript modules. Now you'll see that I'm calling this with an extension of MJS, or M stands for module. This is going to be the file that drives all the interaction. But then really on top of that, I'll have separate modules. And I'll actually put that in a separate folder called modules. And for the first one, we'll create form.mjs. So inside of index.html, right underneath this script tag, I will start by importing all of these scripts. So we'll do index.mjs and we'll set its type to be a module. And I will also set oh, modules form.js. Now, the reason I'm not also including defer here is because modules are deferred by default. Okay, very cool. So let's think about our form, right? We're going to be able to create a form class. Now, the way I normally structure my classes for these types of things, you might already know this, that by me doing this in vanilla JavaScript, I'm sort of trending towards React almost, how you think about like React class components. This is, I think, a cool way of doing it because you really just get to learn a lot about vanilla JavaScript. And frankly, for me, it's just fun. So what I like to do is I will create a private variable that's just held by this class. And I'll call this something like form, or let's say notes form. Inside of my constructor, I get a selector. And then I set notes form equal to document query selector and then whatever they passed in. This way, this form is now attached to whatever thing I pass in. The selector I pass in, that then I will query for. So we know that we need a way for something to happen when I submit, right? So I want, I want an event listener for the submit action. And when submit happens, I don't really want and let's think about this, right? Imagine there was a library that, we, that you were using that didn't give you like a hook into the submit action. I want to leave what happens up to the client, the user of this to decide what they want to happen when there's an event submitted, right? So I think what we can do here is we can say, all right, let's generate or let's, let's, let's add a, a hook to set up event listeners. So let's say, What's a good word for this? So let's say like start event listeners. Okay, so start event listeners is a public method here that takes the notes form. This dot notes form dot add event listener. Okay, and for this one, it's gonna say submit. Now you might be thinking, well, what method is it gonna call? Well, you know what we can do here? We can actually pass in, let's say uh, an object, or rather we can accept, let me think about how I wanna do this. If I, yeah, I could, 
I can accept, I can like destructure and let's say on submit, right? What we can do here, let's say we have this dot on submit inside of here, we can also create a private variable and call it on submit, right? Here I can say this dot on submit equals on submit. And then finally inside of here, we can say this dot on submit. Now, if we do this, whenever there's a submit, it will call this function, but this isn't gonna do anything, right? Because it's just a function reference that's not even being invoked. So I think what we can do is just remove this and just let this call this dot on submit. Okay, let me just move this over here. I like these things just like this. So it's very, very clean right now, right? So we have export class form and let's see what we can do now. From within our index file, we can say import and maybe is form. Yeah, I guess we can call it form. Let's say const notes form equals new form. So we have to pass a selector, right? The selector that I gave my form, I actually haven't given it one yet. Let's call this notes form. Instead of here, I will pass in that selector, notes form. And then here on submit, we can actually get the event. So if you see what I'm doing here, what I did is I'm allowing the client to decide what happens on submit. It's pretty cool. I'm not letting the external library do it for me. It's, it's inverting the control and giving it back to me on this event. So now from within here, I can do whatever I, I please. So let's actually run this and see what happens. Let's also make sure that we prevent the default because I don't want the default submit action to take place. I don't want the form to be submitted. And let's see what this gives us. So if we go back over here, we open our dev tools and we go to the console. Let's just type in a heading and some content and create note. So we see that it's still submitted and we actually didn't get anything here. So it looks like there's a bug and we need to figure out what it is. So let's just make sure that everything looks okay here. So new form with notes form. Oh, of course, there is one thing I didn't do and that was start event listeners. So let's think about this. Can we just do this immediately? Like for example, start event listeners. It's kind of a weird way of doing this, but I'm curious. Okay, well look at that. Now we actually did get that because we started the event listener. This is something that, again, I guess it's, it's a little bit strange that I'm allowing for the client to decide when to start the event listeners. You might assume that that would just happen under the hood but it's okay. I, I quite like the way I'm doing this right now. And just for fun, I'll, I'll continue doing it like this. You know, maybe in the next project that we do, I'll, I'll change it, but I think this is kind of cool. Okay. So start event listeners. Now we get access to that event and now we can really do whatever we want with that event. Right. And you can imagine that in this, at this exact moment, we have, or should have access to the heading and the content. So that's, it's going to lead very nicely into the next section, which is with the heading and content, let's start thinking about how we can create a note and add it to this section down here. So we'll get to that right in the next section. Okay. It's pretty funny after having done JavaScript for a long time, the value of this is still something that trips me up almost every single time. And when I say this, I mean the keyword this. So we left off the previous section with being able to add in a content and heading. And now I want to be able to extract that data from the form. And I also want to be able to reset the value of the form anytime I submit it. So that way I can continually add new notes and not have to worry about manually deleting this. So if I leave this as it is right now, if I want to get the value of the form right inside of here, since this is an arrow function, the way that this works in an arrow function is just like any other variable would work inside of a function. It's lexical. So it means that this itself in an arrow function is not a keyword, but a lexical variable. And this means that it's going to follow any of the other scope rules like other variables would. It's going to look for a reference of this in an outer enclosing scope, and it will continue doing that until it goes all the way to the top. Now, in this case, the next scope is the top, which is the global scope. But because we're in a module inside of JavaScript modules use strict mode, which makes it that the global object is undefined. 
So if we actually open this up, and you can see I was looking up a lot of stuff about scope to really try to wrap my head around this. You can see that here when I submit this, it's undefined. So what I want to do is I actually want to make this a normal function because according to MDN or the Mozilla Developer Network, if I create an event listener, the handler function as a normal function, it will be a reference to the element that called it, which is this notes form, which is great because this notes form is going to give me exactly what I need. I'll be able to get the form data out of this notes form as well as be able to reset the form. So now let's do this again. Let's go back to our notes manager. Oh, we haven't reset this. So you can see now it's form ID notes form. So that's really great. Now, is this running in live server? Because it should be okay. 5,500. Nice. So, for me to be able to use the form data API, I actually need to give these inputs names. So let me give this input a name of heading, and let me give this input a name of content. And I'll show you why in a moment. Now inside of index MJS, what we can do is we can say const form data equals new form data. And this time we can pass this and then we can get const heading equals form data. And I think one of them is get here. We'll say heading and then const content equals form data dot get content. Okay, sweet. Now we have our form data and we can also reset the form. So we can do this dot reset. So now let's try all this out and let's even console log the heading and the content just to make sure we're on the same page and this should all work very nicely at least those two pieces huh and huh okay cool so the form was reset and we can see we have the heading and the content so very nice so the next thing we need to do is work on the notes section that seems like the next most logical step so let's do that next Okay, so let's think about the notes manager, right? I think the first thing we should do is go ahead and create our module. I'm going to call this notes.mjs. And we know that notes is going to be the thing that really all it does is add a single note or add notes. Adding a single note will happen when a user submits a content and heading. In other words, creates a new note. And adding several notes will happen when a user loads the page for the first time and we have existing notes stored in local storage. So let's go ahead and create our notes class in a very similar way that we created the other class. So let's say notes container constructor here will be a selector and this notes container will eerie will eerie will equal <laughs> document query selector and selector. Very nice. And we'll also give a public method called add note that will take a content and a heading. Now you can imagine at this moment, we have this add note, right? So we have content and heading, but it would be nice if we can actually create such a note instead of having to worry about, you know, creating a, a document here, creating an element via the document API. It would be nice if we had a class to handle this for us. So I'm about to introduce a couple of new concepts. Stick around. I think it's going to be a great time. So the first thing I want to talk about are template elements inside of HTML. Template elements are blueprints that we can use as constructors for other elements we want to create. So inside of here under section, we can create a template, a template object, and I'll give it a note template ID. Inside of here, we can go ahead and create a div and we can give this a class of note. And now what is our div going to contain? Well, it's going to have a time. It's going to have a heading, which we'll set to H1. And it will also have some content that I'll make a paragraph tag. So here I can just give this a class of note time. This will actually take care of that bonus user story off the bat. Here we'll say note heading. And here we'll say note content. And of course, we're going to need, let's see, 
we should have a way to delete this note. So let's also give ourselves a button for delete. Now, the only reason I'm filling in delete and hard coding it is because every button can be deleted. And the reason I'm not filling in these values is because different notes will have different values for time, heading and content. So with this template, we can now sort of create a blueprint of a note and then append it to our notes container as we begin to create the, the notes, I guess, right? <laughs> that makes sense. I think instead of here, notes container fluid, now that I'm actually looking at this, we don't need for this to be notes yet. It's good that this is just a fluid container. But what I want to do, let's see, I have a div container here. I have a form. Let me actually stick the HR underneath the form. And I'll keep all this underneath the same container. Now inside of this is where I want to create my notes section dot notes. Okay, this is where my notes will be. Now, as I was saying earlier, the templates will be parsed by the HTML just so that it knows that it's there, but it won't actually draw anything on the screen. It'll just sort of acknowledge, yes, we have a template to work with, but I'm not going to render anything onto the screen. So if we go back to index MJS, actually notes MJS, you might imagine that one thing we could have done is do something like this. I could have done const note equals document create element. Now I've, I could have created a div and then I could have creating a head, heading element document create element h1. I could have added text content to the heading. I could have appended the heading to note, so on and so forth. But that seems very tedious. It doesn't seem like a fun thing to do. So instead, we're going to take advantage of that template element to then be able to just have that HTML already created for us. And that's what the note class will do for us. So we're going to leave this one here for now. And inside of our modules, we'll create another module called note MJS. So let's do export class note. And let's see, this time we're going to give it a constructor. It's going to take content and heading. And here, let's see, we will say note clone. Or let's just say note element. Okay. Now this is where the fun the fun piece comes in. I know that the note element is going to be effectively this div right here. Now templates have an API that we can use to get access to that div. Let's look that up real quick. Anytime we want to get access to the inner contents of a template, we'll have to use the content attribute, which we can find right here. Cloned the new row and entered it into the table. Content clone node true. Now this on its own will give us a document fragment. And you can see here, avoiding document fragment pitfall, a document fragment is not a valid target for various events, as such it is often preferable to clone or refer to the elements within it. Consider the following HTML and JavaScript. You can see that here, they're not just cloning the content, which would be the fragment, they're cloning the first element child, which will be the div, which is the thing that we actually want. And you can see here, it will be an HTML div element where events can be handled. For example, if I click on this first one here, the fragment, no events happen. But if I click here, we do get events. And we do need events for this note, right? Because we want to do things like delete the note, edit the note, so on and so forth. So we're going to do something very similar. We'll come here to note, and now we'll say this note element is equal to document.querySelector we already have the note template. We're going to get the content. We're going to get the first, is it first element child? I think it's first element child. Content first element child dot clone node true. So now we already have access to that node whenever it is that we need it. Okay, now inside of here, we can also set this dot content equal to content. Oh, and this dot heading equal to heading. And then down here, we will create a new public method called generate note and check what this is going to do. It will take the note element and it will set the proper, how do I say this? The, the proper data, right? So inside of note element, this dot note element dot query selector 
we can actually now select the note heading and the note content. So I can say this dot oat element dot query selector note heading dot text content is equal to this dot heading and this dot note element dot query selector note content dot text content is equal to this dot content right and finally we will just return this dot note element now one more thing we need to do is we also want to set the time right because that is one thing that we decided to do there so this is a, a good case to actually introduce a new module and we can call this module utils i'll call this utils.mjs and inside of here i'll say get current date and actually we can do export function get current date i believe here we can say const year equals or maybe i think we need to create a date first const date equals new date and then we can say const year equals date dot get utc full year const month equals date dot get utc month and we'll add one so we can offset it since it'll start from zero we can add that extra month and then const day we'll do date dot get utc day and finally we can just return i'll make this a template literal here we can say year month day oh day so this will give us the current date so back inside of and let's let's do some actually let's go back up here to our models and make sure we're loading everything right i'm going to introduce a couple of new ones here because we need three more so we'll do utils we'll do note and we'll also do notes perfect now inside of note mjs we can import that import get current date now we'll say that this dot date let's actually put it over here this dot date equals get current date perfect and now if we look back at our template we go down here to note time we can do the same thing right note element query selector note time dot text content equals this dot date note time and that's that's correct right note time okay very cool so let's come back to here. I think this all looks good. So we have a note class that will accept the content and heading. It'll set content date and heading. It'll set the date based on the current date. We then set the value of this note element to document query selector note template. We get the content, the first element child, and we clone that. And that's effectively what we return when we generate a note. So now if we go back to notes MJS inside of here, we can say const new note is equal to and we will have to import the note class here i don't think we exported it export class note yeah we did there you go import note let's also export notes const new note will be equal to new note content and heading and then this notes container dot append new note dot generate note and I think we added one too many. Okay, very cool so far. So you can see that we have this private notes container that we set to the selector that we'll be passing when we create notes. And when we add a note, we give it a content and heading that we're getting from the user. We're then creating a new note based on our class. And then when we generate that note, we're actually instantiating a note from that template and then passing that new element into a append and it'll be appended to the notes container. So back over here, we can now say import notes, right? We can say const notes equals new notes. 
with the selector of notes. And we give it a class based selector because you can see that down here we have class of notes and that's where we're going to put our notes. Okay. And then down here we can say notes dot add note. And now we have content and heading. So look at that. And we don't even need to create this, right? Because that's just that that variable is not even needed. So now if we go back, let's see how this is looking. Okay, let's open this notes manager, no errors in the console, which is nice. So I'll say, hello, world. And if we create a note, you can see that we have a note there. Very cool. Now, of course, when I refresh this, there isn't going to be anything, but that's fine. Now I want to see how we can style this a little bit. And that's really going to start getting us to the the ending here. Sort of, I and mean, we still have a lot of work to do, I think, but it's going to be fun. So I'm looking for a card. There we go. Card. I saw a nice example earlier, like something like this, I think would be nice. Just a simple card. I see here they have a button and everything. I might, I think I might just use this. Div class card. Let's actually make our template look like that. Oh, actually, let's put that inside the template. So div class card, template note template, I'll give this also note. So we have a style, we're not going to have an image. We do have a card body. Let's see. So note time we will have note heading be the card title. Card text will be note content. And then, oh, this is actually a link class button, button primary, go somewhere. I think I can remove this. We'll see how time ends up looking. We'll leave that up there for the delete button. Let me see. Let's make this delete. And it's also, let's also look up buttons because I know that I want to give it. Yeah, here danger. Cause that's going to be delete, right? So let's actually make this a button and let's say delete. So let's see how it looks like when we create it now. It should look a lot better. So first note, my first note and check that out. Now we have these notes that are being created for us. And if we create a couple more, how does this actually get wrapped? Okay. So we need to see how we can make this like a flex box sort of thing. Let's actually look that like into that real quick. Do we have Flexbox in here? I'm sure we do. I could have sworn I saw it. containers, fluid containers. Oh, like flex, enable flex behaviors. I'm a Flexbox container. Div class deflex, add display utilities to create. Oh, okay. I see deflex direction. Justify wrap oh, deflex flex wrap. Let's do this deflex deflex flex wrap, right? Because we do want these to wrap. And I think I can do this directly on notes. Let me put those classes first deflex flex wrap. Now, is there a gap? Order, align content, auto margins, fill, grow and shrink. Let me see if there's a gap here. Row gap, column gap. Here we go. When using grid or display flex, you can make use of gap utilities on the parent element. Okay. Grid. Okay. Let's do grid and let's do gap three. So let's put that right here. Gap three. Let's see how that comes out. So with a little bit of, okay, that's one. Okay. Looking awesome. Very cool. And perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. And it'd be nice if we can even center this a little bit. Can we center? I think I saw it earlier on align content, align items, align self. I think it was align items. Justify content. There you go. Justify content center. That's the one I want. So we'll add that here. 
finally, if we come to Notes Manager, do the same thing again. And yeah, that, that to me works a little bit better. Okay, very cool. And I'm fine with this. This is this is coming out to be just like what we want. Okay, so what do we have right now? I think we've gotten a lot. We've gotten very far, right? We have the ability to create notes. And we still need to be able to delete a note. I think that's the next thing we can work on. Now would be a good time actually to quickly just create a readme just for the sake of capturing our user stories. All right, so if we go back to the main repo that we started from, I want to be able to at least get done with these. Let me just use, I believe this is the selector. So let's say that we can create a note. Now we need to be able to edit, delete, and then do local storage. So let's work on delete next, since that's the easiest one. We'll work on delete and edit next. Let's do that. All right, this next part, I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. So we're going to be working on deleting a note. Let's do something with that button that we have. <clears throat> so if we go to, let me think about the module, it's going to be note MJS, right? Okay, whenever we generate a note, we need to set an event listener to that button that we have. The button inside of our template with type button, class button. Yeah, let me give this note button class and let's start doing this. So down here, we'll say this note element dot query selector. We'll look for note button just to make sure I spelled it correctly. Note button. And we'll add an event listener, add event listener for a click. And now let's think about this. Remember now we, what is it that we want to do in here? Whenever I click on it, I want to get a reference to, I want to get a reference to note element. Okay. I don't want a reference to, I don't want a reference to the actual button. Rather, I want a reference to the element itself. So if I pass a normal function here, the the value of this should be the element because that is what we learned earlier. And that's also what it shows in the Mozilla Dev Developer Network documentation. So now that I have access to the note element, we should be able to, well, let's see, console.log this. Let's just make sure as a sanity check because obviously we have had moments where it's not exactly right. So hello world. We didn't do it. Oh, okay. Delete. You see, so check this out function delete. And let's think about why that is this dot note element query selector. No, but oh, of course I, I got confused because in reality, the the owning object is the node button itself, right? The note button itself. So there's a couple of things that we can do here. If I want to use if I were to use this, let's think about how this works again. And let's see if we can actually figure out how to use it, right? So we know that this this has a scope. So the outer scope of this would be the note class itself. So if I were to go and do this console.log this here. Now we should get note element. And I really hope that works because then it will solidify everything that I've just learned. Okay. note. So that's awesome, right? Now this gives us the class though. So even though my, I, I was correct in saying that the value of this would be the note class. However, the note class does not have a remove method. By the way, the remove method that I'm looking for is this one, and this is available on an element. So I don't need the class. I need to actually get the note element itself, but the class does have a reference to the note element, which is this. So could we actually do this dot note element dot remove? Let's see. Let's create a new note. Let's go like this and delete it. That's very cool. So now we can have multiple notes. I'm just, you know, generating random data. Oh, that's interesting. I wasn't expecting this. I wonder what happened there. Ah, 
Oh, because we didn't have the dev tools open last time. Okay. Delete, 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 delete. Very nice. Cool. Well, that takes care of delete. Now let's work on editing. The editing piece, I think, is the most fun piece because we're going to be using a very cool attribute in HTML that I just recently learned about called content editable. What we're going to do is for the heading, I'll set content editable to true. And for the content, I will set content editable to true. And what that does, just like its name implies, it makes the content editable. Who would have known? Now you can actually click on these and change these values, right? But what's going to happen whenever I change these values and how will I how will I like be able to do anything with that? Well, I know that on the like anytime I modify one of these cuz these are the only inputs. These are the only how do I say it? These these controls will fire input events. They will emit input events. And based on the one that I'm changing currently, I can modify the value on the class. I know that sounds like a little bit of a mouthful, but let me show you what I mean here. We can say this dot note element. Let's say now we do this dot note element dot add event listener. We're going to listen for input. And remember, if I do, let's think about this. I want this to reference the note element itself, right? So because of this, I'm going to create a normal function. And that way, this will refer to note dot element. Now the event. Let's see. Let me think about this. Do I even really need to make that change now? Because I'm editing it, but I'm not saving it. And as far as as far as we know, the saving is only happening when I'm doing something with local storage, right? Because at surface value, this looks like it's been saved. But I think once we start working with storage, this piece will make a lot more sense. So let's actually table this for a second. I'm going to comment that for a second. So we just leave that there. Let's go back to our readme. We can now delete something. Now let's work on storage. I think storage is going to be a lot of fun. And of course, we're going to make a separate class for that. So stick around. All right, time for our final module here. It's going to be called storage.mjs. Okay, so inside of here, we can export a class called storage. And what we want to give it an API. Now, in storage, what do we want to do? I had done this question a very long time ago. I just hadn't made a, a video for it. But now that I'm rereading this, I'm thinking, it says when closing the browser window, the notes will be stored and when the user returns, the data will be retrieved. Back then, I used to save all the notes. I used to save every single note every time I add a note. But I wonder if I can just save all the notes at the moment the user closes the browser. Now, is there a way for me to capture that event? Let's see, on browser close event. How to detect a browser or tab closing in JavaScript. Let's see, on before load. The second function is optional to avoid prompting while clicking on this custom prompt. So on before load. On before unload event occurs when a document is about to be unloaded. Okay, the message cannot be removed. Now, if I, if we do that, though, the before unload event is fire when the window, the document and its resources are about to be unloaded, the event enables a web page to trigger confirmation dialog. But now, if I, if I do that, does it automatically return that? Let's see name input add event listener. If event target value, a page listens for changes to a text input. If the element contains a value, it adds a listener for before unload. The before, oh wait, security. The before unload event suffers from the same problems as the unload event, especially on mobile. The before unload event is not reliably fired. For example, the before unload event is not fired at all in the following scenario. 
only when they actually have unsafe changes so as to minimize the effect on performance. Page lifecycle API. That's cool. Wait, what? Active, passive, hidden, frozen, terminated. Go to a hidden state before entering the terminated state. Session ending logic. Ooh, okay. I just learned about this. This might be amazing. The page lifecycle API? It says that since page is being unloaded as a result of user action, always go through the hidden state before entering the terminated state. The hidden state is where session ending logic, persisting application state, should be performed. Terminated state cannot be really detected in many cases. So developers who depend on termination events are likely losing data. Wow, when the page changes from passive to hidden, it's possible the user will not interact with it again until it's reloaded. So is there a way for me to actually observing page in the active, passive, and hidden states, it's possible to run JavaScript code that terminates that determines the current page lifecycle state from existing web platform APIs. Const get state observing state changes. Whoa. Okay, wait, so let state equal get state accepts the next state and if there's been a state change logs okay const log state change const options these life cycle events can all use the same listener page show focus blur visibility change freeze page hide where's the hidden state though because this is get state log state change options used for all event listeners That's capturing event listeners. Window, not all page life will sense have the same target. Page head and page show are fired on window. On document, developer recommendations for each state. When the page changes from passive to hidden, it's possible the user will not interact with it again. What's like the legacy APIs to avoid? Never use unload event on modern browsers. Can we see how to I know this is kind of a tangent, but it's a very cool tangent. I want to see a better way of using this. Let's see. Page lifecycle API. Page lifecycle API, discarded, hidden. How to respond to lifecycle states. Yep. Resume. Discarded, browser compatibility. So it says you can use the following JavaScript function to determine the active, passive, and hidden states of a given page. Okay, with the release, developers can observe when a hidden tab is frozen and unfrozen to determine whether a page is discarded while in hidden. Now, how do we get state? Page lifecycle JS. This is so cool. This is very cool. I, I won't spend too much more time looking at this, but I really want to use this because this is exactly what I need. Is there a, a better way for this page lifecycle? Page visibility. Okay, examples. Pausing audio on page hide. Okay, document visibility change. Now, how how do I know? You see, the thing is, the audio was playing, but how do I know it's because it was hidden? Oh. I see, but that's hidden. That's not closed. Although hidden means it could be unloaded, which means it will be closed. Well, let's try it out. Let's just, let's see what happens here. If I, if I do that instead, if I go to index, let's, I think I'd like to have this code in the main code here, right? Sort of like top level. 
So document add event listener visibility change. If document is hidden, let's do something real quick. Let's do local storage dot set item. Hello world. Oh, okay. I don't want to play that anymore. That's fine. That's fine. I guess let's, I'm going to close all my tabs here. So, well, yeah, I unloaded it, right? So if we go now, well, let's go back to localhost 5,500. So that's where we started everything. I don't think I'll have anything in applications now. I got some old, some old data in here. Okay, so if I, well, that's if it's hidden. Okay, hello world, that, that worked actually. Now if I close it and come back, let's see, this is the moment of truth. It'd be very cool if it worked. Wow, okay, that worked. So this is exactly what I want. Back then I was making it more difficult by, oh, I'm sorry, there's an airplane or a helicopter coming around here. So I'm sorry if, if you all hear that. Back then I was doing it on every single note ad, I would store it, but now we can just do it when the page closes. And I like that a lot. That makes things way easier. Now, document, and, and what's what's the first one? Because that's visibility, visibility change, MDN page visibility. How about when we load the page the first time? Page is the foreground tab of a non-minimized window. Visible, I don't want it to be visible, like visible or hidden. Now, is this part of the page lifecycle API? I feel like this is actually a little bit page visibility API. Well, I think this is good. This is this is really good for us, right? Because I don't really need to know when the page was loaded. I just know that it's loaded just because the JavaScript will be run that first time. Okay, so I like this a lot. Let's now figure out how to write this storage class. Let's go back to storage. So now we'll need a way to read notes, right? I'm gonna make this a static method. So read notes, we also want to Let's see, add notes. So we won't add notes during the duration of the application, only when we close the application do we add them. So we read them and then we can also edit and delete. So here we'll say static edit note and this one will take an ID and a content and heading and then we'll have static delete note and here we'll take an ID. Okay, so I think based on this, we can start working on something. So let's do add notes. I like add notes a lot. Now for add notes, we, we could just do it. We can sort of brute force this, right? Instead of just appending, instead of like finding the difference of what's stored versus what's currently on screen, we can just delete the key and re-add it. I think that would be the best way of doing it. It's it's the most simple way of doing it. So let's look up local storage here just to see if we can, like, are we able to delete something that doesn't exist? Remove item. If there's no item associated with the given key, this method will do nothing. So that's fine. So when we add notes, let's do local storage dot remove item notes. And then we'll do local storage dot set item notes and we'll pass the JSON stringified version of the notes that we get from here. So add notes will have to be an array and inside of here we have to stringify it because the value here has to be a string. That's why we need to stringify that JSON or stringify that array. Okay, and then for read notes, let's see. What we could do is we could say return, let me see, const stored notes equals 
local storage dot get item notes. Now get item or null if the given given key does not exist. So if stored notes equals to null or stored notes dot length. Actually no. We should actually yes, if stored notes equals null or json dot parse stored notes dot length is equal to zero, so it's just an empty array, then we'll just return. We won't actually do anything. Or we'll just return stored notes. Although in this case we should also parse it, right? JSON parse dot stored notes. Because is it bad if I try to the only reason I'm doing it twice is because let me make sure. If I try to JSON dot parse null, okay that just returns null, so that's fine. So I can actually do that. Yeah, JSON dot parse. So if local storage get item, if that returns null, so if stored notes is null or stored notes dot length is zero, just return. Else return stored notes. And you really, you know what we can do? We can actually just return it and let the application code handle it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we could, and if it's an empty array, let it be an empty array, you know? As long as it's not null, it can, rendering an empty array is essentially the same as returning nothing. So we can, we can even condense this further and say, return json.parse this. Yeah, actually we can just return that. We can just return whatever that returns. All right, if it's null, we'll let the application code handle it, or it'll be some array, whether empty or not, and we'll get something that we can work with. So let's see, let's, let's, let's focus on these two right now. If we go back to index MJS, let's see, new form, new notes, so we'll need to do, so we have the document add event listener here. We can say const existing notes equals storage. Over here, we'll say, is it read notes? Okay. Storage read notes is either gonna be null or, yeah, let's think about this. Const existing notes might be null, or it could be an array. We have notes down here. So here we can say if existing notes not equal to null, or actually we can actually just say if existing notes, well, we should say not equal to null. Yeah, if existing notes is not equal to null, then we can say notes dot add. See, now we just have the single note, but we need to now go ahead and augment this a little bit so that it works. So check out how we're going to change this. So notes, let's actually put this down here. Let's move this up a little bit, const existing notes. Okay, so check this out. What we can do the notes, the notes that we had previously, like any note that is stored is going to have a date and an ID, right? So inside, inside of add note, we also need a way to be able to get that information. Date, heading, and what's the other one? Time. But I also feel like inside of here, let me think about this. It'd be nice if this accepted just an object called note. And then in here, we can also pass new note, note, and then check this out. Inside of note, constructor will also be a note. Well, here we can destructure everything. We can have content, date, heading. Yeah, content, date, heading, and there's another one that I'm missing. ID, 
content date heading and ID. So anytime that's the one thing we haven't created yet, right? Content date heading ID. So the content, let's destructure all this because it's going to come from the note. The content will be in the case of a new note, whatever we type in the case of an existing note, it'll still be content uh, for date. It'll be the existing date. So we'll try to use date or yeah, we'll either supply a date, which in that case will just be the one that came from storage. Or when we don't apply a date, we'll get the current date. Heading will be the one that we apply from storage. And then this ID could be the one that we supply from storage. Or uh, let's do something like math.random times number dot max save integer. And we'll like floor this whole thing here give it like a random ID that we can use later on. So content date heading ID, right? Because this will choose a number between zero and number max save integer. And when I'm, I'm doing this because content and heading will always just be either what the user supplied or what came from storage, but date, date can, date will never be supplied by the user, right? So we'll either generate it the first time or in the existing case of getting it from storage, we'll just set it to whatever the value was when we stored it, similar to the ID. User's never gonna set the ID, so we'll either generate it the first time or set it from storage. In index.js now, or actually we have to go, that was note, we have to go back to notes. So now we can pass a note to here. We can pass a note to add note. And now add note, I see it's coming inside of here, right? So here, we can just do, yeah, we can pass this content and heading to add a note. That represents a note. It doesn't have an ID or a date, so we generate it ourselves. And now inside of here, a couple of things we have to do, existing notes. So this is going to be an array. So what we could do if existing notes is not equal to node or null, then we can say for const notes of existing notes. We can say notes dot add note note. Yep, just like that. And why is it complaining here? Oh, for const notes of existing notes. So we try to get existing notes. This can return null or some array. If it's not null, then we'll try to go through that array and we'll add a note every single time. Remember, the ones that are stored already have an idea and a date, so it'll work out just fine. And then whenever we go here, right, so we have add note, we already read note. So, okay, notes.add note. When we do this, we'll say storage dot, let's see, add notes at the storage dot add notes. Yeah. And this is going to take now an array of notes. What's the easiest way to get an array of notes? I think the best thing. Let's think about this. Okay. Now it becomes a little bit interesting because I, I would love a way to not have to worry so much about positioning this all in the right location because I want notes to be up here because what, what I could do, okay, inside of notes, I want to get a new element called get notes. And this can actually just return, let's see. Yeah, we can do this array dot from this notes container. I think children. Yeah, I think we can do that. Storage dot add notes notes dot get notes. Okay, that should give us what we need. Let's see, because we we just wrote a lot. So let's come back to notes manager. Let's delete all this stuff. Let's see, hello world. Okay, we have a note created. Hello to world, word. Okay, so if I 
well, if I actually leave here, if I leave here, what's going to happen? Interesting. Wait, if I leave here and come back. Okay, so it, it almost sort of worked, but like the notes were stored, kind of. Let's see, I came back on visibility change. Oh, but I never wrote. Yeah, so it only happens. It doesn't happen when it's hidden. They only get stored properly. Storage.addnotes, notes.getnotes. Yeah, that should have worked. Oh, wait a second, though. Storage.addnotes. JSON stringify notes. Yeah, there's there's uh, something we got to look into here. So sources. If I come here. Storage add notes. About notes dot get notes. Notes container. Children. Okay. Ah, I see, but this is not. Yeah, we need to be able to actually get the data from each one of these different notes. Let's think about this. Yeah, it'd be nice if I had just a, I guess that was the nice thing about adding a note to the storage every single time I added it. Every single time I created a single note, I would add to my local storage and I would already have it in the object that I wanted. Now I have to do a little bit more work here. So notes.getNotes. Let's see, we could we could create something interesting here. We could do return array. Oh, but you know what? It doesn't even have we don't get the ID or anything. And we can't actually get the class instance. Because that's just, yeah. How do I how do I get the instance? Yeah, that's going to be an issue. Because I'm not storing I'm not storing the ID. You know what I could do, though? Hmm. There is something that I can do, we can set these as data attributes on the HTML itself, although it's a little bit weird to have the ID as part of the HTML and not like an internal thing. But inside of note. Let's see. Yeah, it's certainly not certainly not the best thing to do. This dot note element. And the note element is yeah, what, what I'm thinking of doing is we can actually say like this dot note element dot and let's look at let's look that up real quick. Data I think it's data SRC. Data attribute data set. Custom data attributes on elements, accessing values, setting values, element data set example. So we can do this note element dot data set dot ID is this ID. And this note element dot data set dot time or dot date equals this dot date because with that what this will allow for us to do is when we go back to here to get notes we can actually return a map so we can map over this we can say note element and now we can return for example like content it could be note element dot query selector note content Date can be note element dot data set dot date. Heading could be note element dot query selector dot note heading. 
and ID can be note element dot query selector, or actually no, it can be data set dot ID. So maybe not the nicest way of doing it, but I'm also glad I did it this way because I just, I learned something new. I'm using data sets. I haven't really used them like this in a long time. So it just gives me the, the ability to like sort of get into the weeds a little bit more. So sometimes I like doing these things so that I just get to hone my skills, right? So let's remove this. So, I mean, it looks like something sort of happened, right? So if we, if I go over one of these and I do, let's look at our application. We don't have anything there. Okay, so nothing happened. Let's just like add some notes here. Okay, if we go and come back, did anything happen? Nothing happened that time. Oh, but did we, yeah, we're only going to get notes. Although they should have been stored though. Yeah, they definitely should have been stored. Oh. Notes dot get notes. Notes container, get notes. Okay. Note dot content, data set did. Okay, so we do have data set and ID. Now I need to make sure that it's stored correctly. So when it's hidden, oh, storage dot add notes. Okay. And then storage dot read notes. So if we go now back to application, we can see that it, it almost kind of worked. Except for the heading and the ID. Oh, I know why because we need to get the text content of each one of these. So let's go back, let's remove this. Let's remove this. Let us go to application, remove this, add some notes. Let's come back. So the, the hidden thing this does not work that well, but now you can see that the heading and the content were saved. So that's pretty cool. Now, when we delete something, right? So if I want to delete a note, I need to go and find the corresponding note inside of storage. So in storage for delete note, we're going to get an ID. So let's do something here. I can create a private method because I want to, for each one of these delete note and edit note, I need to find, I need to first find a note, right? So if, let's see, if local storage dot, maybe we'll do something like const stored notes equals local storage dot get item notes. If stored notes dot no, yeah, if stored notes is equal to null, we can throw new error, no stored notes. Okay, and now we can say const find note or found note equals stored notes or let's do json.parse stored notes dot find note. We'll find the note whose ID is equal to ID. And this says find will return what? I think it's just undefined, right? So if found note equal to null, throw new error, no stored I'll make this a template literal. Oh, what happened here? That was weird. No stored note with ID, ID. And finally, so we found it. So we can say const filtered notes equals json.parse stored notes dot filter for the note whose notes ID is not equal to found note dot ID. And then we can say local storage 
dot set item json stringify filtered notes right so we're going to see if we have any stored notes by doing local storage get item notes if we have if it's null then there are no stored notes else if it's right if it's null or empty i think we can actually do a little bit better here so what if i do json.parse if stored notes equals null or stored notes dot length is equal to zero no stored notes that's fine the found note will be stored notes dot find if found note equal to null okay const filter notes will be stored notes dot filter note where the note id is not equal to the found note id you want to keep all of them where the node is not equal to the one that we found and then we finally set items json.stringify filtered notes awesome so that should work and very similarly it's it's pretty much going to be the same for edit note right so we can almost copy this entire code right here no stored notes if we find a note no now this time for the found note we can say found note dot content equals content found note dot heading equals heading and then actually we can just say local storage set item json stringify of what should we do we can just actually we can just really found note is stored note we changed it yeah i just i think we can actually just put the stored notes right back in there we parsed it we found it instead of stored notes so we just set items json stringify stored notes so now we have edit and delete so inside of let's see our delete this dot note element dot remove let's make sure that we get our storage class in here import storage from storage mjs let's go over here so whenever we remove it we'll also make sure to call the storage function so we'll say storage was it delete note yeah delete note now we're going to need to pass an id right so this note element let's see this note element here is going to be the element itself because that's the enclosing scope now if i need access to the class let me think about that note button this dot note oh no that's fine yeah i keep i keep doing that but this dot note element yeah we could do this dot id and that should delete that one so now if we come back here okay now if i let's see how, how are we gonna know let's create a new one delete this one delete okay create note if i come up here see we're not actually getting we're not actually adding a note. Oh, I think that's, well, I guess that's fine. Cause if I delete a note before I ever go, like if I, if I leave now, come back, this now has three. So if I go to delete this one, can we refresh this? That's the thing. So I deleted it, but it'll only take effect once I leave. Okay, so that's fine. So that is working. And for delete, or rather for edit, if I go to this is so cool. Oh, we never actually implemented that, did we? Yeah, this is where that piece comes in now, right? So this note element dot add event listener input, what we need to do in here. this note element yeah because i want 
I'm using a function because I actually want note element. Because here I can say if. Yeah, I guess we can say if event dot target dot class list dot contains note heading. And I know I'm editing the heading, else I know I'm editing the content. And what I can do here, let me think about this. So I just want to automatically, yeah, that's not, again, since I'm only, I don't think I need to actually edit anything. I don't think I need, I don't think I need a storage. I don't think I need this edit note because when I, if I edit that and I leave the page, right? If I say, yeah, this is so cool. Wow, edit, right? If I leave the page and I come back, yeah, this is gonna have the edit. And if I refresh, this is so cool, wow, edit. And now really the, the main moment is if I open this in an incognito window, well, of course, no, that's not gonna work, right? This is so cool, yeah. It's because my, my function works when I leave the page. It'll read the DOM and that content editable makes it so the DOM can be modified. So I don't need to have a storage function for editing anything. So that's very nice. That, that makes this very clean. Anyway, I think that's it. I've been working on this one for a while, but I'm really, really happy with this one. I think I'll, I'll save the next section for maybe some optimizations and some cool things that we can do. So stick around. All right, now that we're pretty much done, let's let's have some fun. Let's clean some things up a bit. I'm mostly happy with the how the HTML looks. Let's go ahead and just write some notes here. I, I mostly like writing some quick documentation here. And I thought, do we not get JS doc for free? Oh, wow. I thought we would, but I guess not. Yeah. Form class that manages user input and event handling. Registers event listeners to take in user input. Sweet. Let's go to note. manages an instance of a note. Let's see, so here we can say, uses the note template and fills in relevant data. Also registers deletion event listeners. Okay, and this will return HTML div element instance of a note. An instance of a note. Let's go back here to make sure I'm adding periods everywhere. That's fine. Notes. So I'll pretty much just copy this one. Manages, manages note instances. adds a single note. Now inside of this new note here is going to be, I wish there was a nice way of defining this. I mean, I think with JS doc, we could define a type. Yeah, type. Object, optional parameter, callbacks, type definitions. I think there's a, I thought there was a way to Object, my object with properties, a number. Oh yeah, let's do something like this. Yeah, I like this. Object, my object. Yeah, I think what we can do here is like on top right here, 
Whoa, no, I definitely don't like that. <laughs> Object, let's say note. We'll have note.content. We're gonna have four different things here. Note.content, note.date, note.heading, and note.id. And with the exception of all of these, just ID is gonna be a number, and these will all be strings. I don't like that auto formatting. Can we not format this? Oh, wait a second. I also have to symbol name, param, number, at type object, an array of my class. Oh, yeah, I think I have to do that. At type optional parameter callbacks at type object type definitions. Yeah, here, add note, add type, note, and that's just disgusting. Can we not have formatting for this? Maybe we need to, maybe I need to make this into a comment. Yeah, maybe it just doesn't like it. Just trying to format this a little bit, make it look decent. Okay, that looks a little bit better, I suppose. Okay, adds a single note, a note type. Ah, I guess, yeah, we know what note is, right? Get notes. Returns an array of note objects note objects so we can here say array array of note okay just some some light very light documentation right upper class for local storage uh, local storage operations utils Helper, so helper function for helper function to generate and format date. Returns a date string in year, month, day format. Let's do some for these. Adds adds several notes to storage. This is just going to be an array of note. I'll leave that like that. I'll say deletes a single note, deletes a single note. This is a number ID unique note identifier. And then we'll say reads, reads notes from storage. And this will be, let's see, either an array of notes or null. Okay, so I think that's good enough on some basic documentation. Pretty much have everything set up nicely. I'm very happy with where we are right now. So I think the last thing we need to do, if we go back to our readme over here, we can edit a note. We took care of this, and if we even look at the bonus features, I think the last thing we have is markdown format here. So let's see how we can get to that last piece before wrapping this up. Okay, so we're nearing the completion of our project. The last thing that we have to do that's part of a bonus is being able to add marked a markdown parser. So I already have a tab open here with some of the instructions on getting started, and we're just gonna go ahead and use it. We can see here as far as compatibility goes, it looks like it's compatible with everything but IE11, not really anything new. We've probably all heard of that. It also warns us of sanitizing the output HTML by using something like DOM Purify, which well, I guess I'll probably go ahead and do as well. But for now, let's get the general functionality working. It looks like we can deliver this by using a CDN, which I think is probably the easiest way to get started. So let's come back to our index HTML. 
and we have a script here for bootstrap let's also put this next one here let's go ahead and defer that now we have marked min.js so what we could do is what happens if we don't have so it says markdown right edit a note in markdown format like if i don't write it in markdown format is that going to do anything let's see let's go to notes mjs let's go to the moment that we're actually going to create the note i think that's inside of note it's been so long already that i feel like it's a long time yeah so it's it's going to be i think content is going to be the main piece right now one thing one thing we could do let's see i was going to say maybe create like a radio box or a checkbox for letting the user decide if they're going to write it in markdown but then we'll be running into issues where like they still write markdown and they don't click the checkbox i feel like it's just like user error so let's just assume anything can be marked down i want to see how that goes so i think to use it we just have to do document get element by ID marked dot parse so text content will equal marked dot parse this dot content now I'm very curious how this is gonna work if we go back to localhost 5500 okay so we already see like yeah, it, it's it's automatically outputting it as paragraph tags. If I create a new one, we go to sources, we go to note over here. Let's put this down. Yeah, if we go to marked dot parse, if we just do this, we go to console, type this out. Yeah, it's going to automatically just make it a paragraph tag. So what do we want to do? I guess we, yeah, I guess let's do that. Let's let's very quickly add a checkbox here. So let's go to bootstrap. This is what we'll do. Checkbox, checkboxes and radios. That's a large checkbox. It's a very large checkbox. Default large. Input group text. HTML input group text. Oh, type radio. I see. Input class. So it just has to be this. Oh, because this is. We recommend adding to the form input when there's no visible text next to the input. Aria label text input with checkbox. Now, is there no first and last name, multiple add ons, checkboxes and radios? Is that really the only button groups, list groups, checkbox toggle button? Okay, I, I like this one single toggle, HTML checked. Yeah, I like this a lot. Let's add this one. Let's go to our template. And right here, let's see how this looks. Here we can say markdown. Let's see how this looks. Oh, no, that says checked. I don't want that there, right? I want that on my, oh, I'm not doing that right. I want that on my form. So that should come like right after button. Yep, that's not what I wanted. Let's come back here. Let's copy this. Okay. Let's see how this looks now. Let's remove all this. Okay, so checked autocomplete single toggle. So what's the difference between here, checked and autocomplete? Is that just because it starts off? So if I remove the checked, come back here. Okay, so that still works. Okay, 
So let's do enable markdown. I think that's all right. Now, do I get type checkbox? This is on the form. If I go to form.js, this is submit. This is an input checkbox. I guess what we can do here, what event can I listen to from there? Disabled, they are conveyed differently by assistive technologies. So let's see, MDN checkbox event. Do we have examples of events here? Value, checks, inter interdeterminate, indeterminate validation, example, CSS, change. Okay, I like that one, change. That sounds good. So over here, inside of our form, we can say this dot notes form dot add event listener change this dot oh what's going to happen on change we're going to have to add a new hook inside of here right on change here we'll have on change and finally the reason I'm adding a new line is in between these is to signify that like notes form is the element and these are event handlers. Okay, so then an index MJS, which I don't have open, we'll create a new one here called on change function event. Let's see how this works. Console.log event. How often or does it happen when I want it to happen? Okay. Okay, so it also happens, I think, huh? Yeah, it, it's also happening when I'm doing, so it can't be, yeah, I need to make sure that's only happening from that. So is trusted true target? So if the event dot target I think there's a tag name that I can use here. That could be nice. Tag name is input, but then these are also inputs, right? I need it to have, let's see. Well, let, let me think about this still though. Even if I say, if I save it with markdown mode, then when I create the node, yeah, I guess that's what we can do, right? checked or not checked is there it'd be nice if there's oh wait a second isn't there a value for checked because the type of this is a checkbox isn't it type checkbox value on yeah wait how do we get the value checked yeah no i think I think we can actually use checked. It's a Boolean attribute. We don't need to do anything. Checked should be here. Yep, checked, true, perfect. That's what we need. So on change event.target.checked. So now for this, when we submit it, let's think about this. Actually, I don't think I wanna give control to the user here, right? I definitely don't want to give control here. So for the note, what we can do, or rather notes, where form, that's where it was. Okay, here, I shouldn't do, let's think about this. Notes form, add event listener. I think, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're gonna remove on change here. We're gonna remove this. We're going to add another variable here. So we'll call this notes form on submit, and then we'll say markdown mode enabled is equal to false. We can sort of 
tighten these up again here. And now over here, we can say this dot markdown mode enabled equals not this dot markdown mode enabled. Right, and now whenever I call, now what we can do is we can call this function on submit and we can pass the value of this markdown mode enabled. So what I wanna do is, let's think about this. I wanna pass data back to the caller. What I can do is I can I can pass both of these this dot on submit notes form if I want to capture well the notes form is just going to be an element what we could do and this will be pretty interesting if this actually works it'd be very cool if it works I want to essentially pass a reference yeah, I can call this. I wonder if I can do this. This would be this would be crazy. If I bind, can I can I bind this? If I bind this to this dot on submit, and let me let me give you the reasoning behind this, right? Because this on submit, like when I get over here, if I if I make this a function. Actually, it's, it's just gonna happen over here, right? Let me, I feel like I'm all over the place, but let me explain. If I make this a normal function, which it is already, this dot form data, this itself is the notes form. But if I want it to be the class, I could instead make this, yeah, if I make this an arrow function here, because this is lexical, it's going to look at where it was actually defined and we're not gonna have access to the class, but I do have access to the class in here. So I could do something like this dot on submit dot bind this. I'm so curious. I'm so curious about this. <laughs> console.log this we've come a long way we've come a long way sources index mjs what is this here oh I need to also oh did I start steam by accident I started steam by accident okay event dot prevent default let me just copy this one down here I'm not even sure if I can bind. Well, no, let's let's see. Let's not say anything yet. It's fine. So what happened there? Maybe instead, you know what? Maybe, hmm. What if we just do this instead? Okay, so this is the form okay the form class because it's the form class now just just to make sure if i didn't bind this here if i didn't bind this then this should be undefined if i didn't bind this it should be undefined here oh wait no 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 okay it's still function event though but here, this is the notes form, not the class itself, right? So, so much that we're learning here. The reason it's the notes form is because that, let me delete all, not delete, close all these. This is a normal function, which means that it will take the this value of the object that it was called on, which is notes form. But I also need access to this variable, which I don't have on notes form. So I need access to the class. If I make this an arrow function, They don't get undefined because the this in that case right will be looking in this lexical environment 
which will say that this is in the global scope and because it's a module global is undefined so what we do instead is inside of here we bind the this from inside of here right and we keep this like this right because this this i guess if you want to say this this actually i, I still think we need to keep it as an arrow function Yeah, I still think we need to keep it as an arrow function. Well, I'm confused again, but let's see. I was sort of on a roll there. So it's still undefined there because at the end of the day, it's still using. Okay, so let's do function event. Now this is the form itself. So that's fine because what I can do inside of here now is we can get all this out uh, form data is this dot notes form this dot notes form notes dot add note content and heading and this dot markdown mode enabled let's see how this looks now and I also just realized that that is going to be private, which isn't great. And it, yeah, it's going to be private field notes form must be declared in an enclosing class. So let's not, let's make notes form and markdown mode public. Oh, private field notes form must be declared in an enclosing class. Oh, wait, we also did not do this one. And over here to change these, this dot notes form, form MJS and index MJS. We're still getting some, yep, over here, index MJS, notes form, markdown enabled. Okay, are we looking better? Let's go back to sources. Okay. Right. Okay. Now add note. Come inside of here. Okay. And that's cool. Now what we can do is inside of add note, we'll say markdown mode enabled. Here we can say very similarly markdown mode enabled equals false. This markdown mode enabled equals markdown mode enabled. And finally, let's see, this is notes MJS and we're, we still have to actually, I don't even need to, I don't need to create this here. I still need to pass this inside of new note dot generate notes. We're doing a lot of like passing in here. Yep. And that's where we get it right. Generate node markdown mode enabled let's do markdown mode enabled inside of here we have this and finally we can say markdown mode enabled mark dot parse or this dot content and we end up with this All right so if markdown modes enabled we'll parse it with markdown else we'll just use the normal content so let's also make sure we're updating all of these so we have param, this is boolean, markdown mode enabled, whether or not markdown is enabled for this note. Okay, do the same thing for the other places. I feel like, man, just went through like a whole thing adding this feature, pretty cool. This comes after there. Index MJS. Okay, markdown mode enabled. I think that's all good. So if I delete all these, I refresh here. I go to application. Let me delete all the notes. And I can say hello world. 
tool, not markdown, create note, awesome. Oh, this reset didn't work, so that's fine. Enable markdown, create note. Okay, so the markdown does work for that next one now. We'll also make sure that this reset is this dot notes form dot reset. Let's make sure that works. Okay. Very cool. Now everything's in its place. And I think since the video has gone by so long, well, if it's easy to use DOM Purify, if we can just use that with like a CDN, unmidified development version, can I configure DOM Purify? Yeah, because I think the best thing to do just include Dom Purify on your website. Yeah, is there, let's see, how did we deliver this one, cdnjsdeliver.net? Yeah, can we use, let's see. Oh, nice, okay. Let's do DOM purify. Yeah, nice. Default, copy to clipboard, copy URL. So does that just work? Oh, beautiful, awesome. So yeah, I think we can just do that now. Let me just copy that. I'll copy this script, put this down here. I'll cut this, I'll paste this. Now we have DOM purify. And I think, based on what it's telling me, I should now just be able to use the API. How far do I have to go? Oh, DOM purify, dot sanitize. And then inside of note, so many places where we're doing things now. So if marked out mode is enable, we'll do DOM purify mark dot parse this guy make this a little bit easier to read oh not like that do this up here boom so now we're purifying whatever the user inputs that way it's not interpreted by our web page and then it's executing something you know it's like people can inject javascript into your website cross-site scripting one of like the number one security bugs in all of web development so we're effectively preventing that by do using a library like this this is something that a framework will take care of for you but it's good that we're also doing it ourselves here okay so i think that's it i think that literally completes the project we're able to create everything here we can do markdown mode so I could do like, hello, wow. And it should come out to be an H1. That's very cool. So that's super cool. I'm very happy with everything that we've done. This has been a very long video, but I, I hope that you have all learned a lot by watching it. I have learned a lot by doing it. And I'm very happy that I was able to use things like Bootstrap, which I haven't used for a long time. Things are looking pretty nice. I mean, I'm pretty happy with the way the UI looks. We got to use Marked. We got to use the DOM Purify library. We did a little bit of light JS documentation around here. What are the cool things that we did? We finished all the features and all the bonus features. You know, we did a lot with just like nullish coalesce, nullish coalescing operators that I thought was very cool. Did a lot of stuff, a lot of really good solid work in here. And I'm happy to share it with you all and share this video. So if you like this, and if you want to see more, don't forget about greatfrontend.com. The reason I bring that up again is because if you enjoy this type of content and you're still looking for a place to be able to hone in your skills, you can always come to this website. I'll have an affiliate link down in the description. You can practice so much of pretty much exactly what we did through vanilla JavaScript and React, and you can continue honing your skills with JavaScript, system design, UI components, and even random quiz questions that will surely test your knowledge on the subject matter. So if that all sounds good to you, make sure to visit the website and also make sure to subscribe to this channel and you'll continue seeing more great vanilla JavaScript content as well as some other stuff I'm working on. That being said, I'm going to go and drink a lot of water because I've talked a lot during this video. So happy coding everyone and I'll see you all next time.